Billy Mitchell, a United States Army general who most regard as the father of the United States Air Force. He served in France during World War I, and by the time that conflict was over, he was in command of all the American air combat units in the country. After the war, he was appointed as the deputy director of the Air Service and began to advocate for increasing uh, military investment in air power. He was convinced that future warfare would really be about air power. In particular, he argued, and he was a very forceful personality, he argued very vociferously for bombing battleships, bombing naval vessels. As a matter of fact, he organized a test to check and prove his theories about uh, naval aeronautics, and in doing so, he had some uh, old abandoned ships towed out into the Atlantic, and they did diving runs on them, and it was resoundingly successful. However, the upper military brass uh, of the United States did not believe it really proved anything, and did not believe that uh, really air power attacking ships was going to be very successful in the future. However, there was somebody at that demonstration who was quite impressed with what air power could do to ships. That was the ambassador from Japan. He contacted the superiors in Japan, and as a result, the Japanese Navy shifted from a focus on ship-to-ship combat between battleships and instead began to build more aircraft carriers and more planes that could take off and land on aircraft, uh, on uh, an aircraft carrier. As a matter of fact, As a result of what Billy Mitchell was trying to get the United States to do, Japan became the number one naval aviation country on the planet. And you're well aware of what happened as a result of that, Pearl Harbor. Billy Mitchell was right. They should have listened to him, but they didn't. As a matter of fact, he irritated so many of his superiors that in 1925 he was demoted from Brigadier General to Colonel. Later that year, he was court-martialed for insubordination, and then he resigned uh, uh, his uh, commission. As a matter of fact, this is what he said. He said, the Army and Navy leaders have an almost treasonable administration of the national defense. He continued to argue. As a matter of fact, Mitchell was so strong in his opinions and was later vindicated to be correct that after he was dead, FDR promoted him to Major General. I don't know what good that does you once you're dead, but anyway, he did get promoted back. He is the first person to ever have a military aircraft named after him, the B-25 Mitchell, as a result of what he had done. Naval aeronautics is a direct result of Billy Mitchell and his influence and his ideas and what he had seen and what he wanted to do. Most people have never heard of him, Uh, But we've certainly heard about the results of his ideas and theories. Now, I want to go back a little further in history. Talk about someone who's very interesting. Katerina von Bora. Now, Katerina von Bora is probably known, uh, more popular by most people, as Katerina Luther, the wife of Martin Luther, who was the man who launched the Protestant Reformation. When she was five years old, her father sent her away to the Benedictine cloister, 1604. After spending all of her life in uh, religious pursuit, she became interested in the growing Reformation, particularly as happening in Germany. She grew dissatisfied with the life in the convent. So she conspired with several other nuns to escape. They contacted Martin Luther and asked for his assistance. So on the night before Easter, April 4th, 1523, Luther sent Leonard Coppa, who was a merchant who regularly went uh, to the convent to deliver herring. He smuggled the nuns out uh, in his wagon among the fish barrels, so I'm sure they arrived smelling quite nice. They made it to Wittenberg, and a local student there at Wittenberg University wrote this to a friend of his. He said, a wagon load of vessel virgins has just come to town, all more eager for marriage than for life. God grant them husbands, lest worse befall. (laughs) 
Now, Luther did his part and was able to arrange homes, uh, employment, uh, marriages for all of those nuns except for Katerina. He did not believe that he needed to get married. Most of his closest advisors did not believe that he needed to get married because they were afraid that that would damage uh, the Reformation, of which Martin Luther was the leading figure and the leading voice. However, he fell in love with the fishy smelling woman. He finally decided to get married, and this is what he said. He said that his marriage would please his father, rile the Pope, call the angels to laugh, and the devils to weep. So he married Katerina von Bora on June the 13th, 1525. And she's one of the major reasons that the Reformation movement was so successful. After they were married, she immediately took on the job of administrating the entire monastery and all of the family holdings and everything. She bred and sold cattle and ran a brewery to pay uh, to support her own family. As you can imagine, with Martin Luther, people were coming all the time to visit him, and she managed his entire schedule and who could see him and when and took care of all their appointments and everything that went on with all of that. You could imagine with hundreds of people a uh, week coming to want to see the reformer Martin Luther. When there was widespread illness, he opened a hospital and worked in it alongside other nurses to care for people who were sick. Luther called her the boss of Dusseldorf. That was the name of the farm that they owned. He called her the Morning Star of Wittenberg because she rose at 4 o'clock every morning to do all of these tasks and to fulfill her responsibilities. She was quite forceful in managing not just the home, but Luther himself. He often call, times called her my Lord Katie. <laughs> Man, that's true love. <clears throat> he made this statement. He said, if I can endure conflict with the devil, sin, and a bad conscience, then I can put up with the irritations of Katie Von Bora. <laughs> so he, she ran all of this so that he could devote himself to being the leader of the Protestant Reformation that would change the face of Christianity around the globe. In addition to all of that stuff that she did, managing Luther and his calendar and all the people coming to see him, and the farm and the monastery and all of that, she also bore six children. Hans, Elizabeth, Magdalena, Martin, the favorite child, Paul, and Marguerite. Beyond those six, they also raised four orphaned children. Now, I guess almost everybody that had any kind of Western Civ class has heard of Martin Luther. But most people know almost nothing about Katerina von Bora, but without her, the Protestant Reformation as we know it would not have happened. August 28, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to a crowd of over 200,000 people from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. The date marks the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Dr. King had hoped to mend the racial fractures which are going on within our country. People arrived for the speech, and as he mounted the podium, Dr. King threw away his prepared speech and just spoke from his heart that day to deliver one of the most memorable speeches in American history, the I Have a Dream speech. Standing near the stage was Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin is the reason there was the March on Washington. He was the one who had organized the whole thing. Someone said this, Rustin organized this march in an eight-week period without cell phones, email, or faxes. He and his team were working the phones hard and were typing letters constantly. If it had not been for Bayard Rustin, there would have been a handful of people who showed up, and we would not know much, if anything, about the speech that Martin Luther King Jr. delivered on August 28, 1963. But that's not all about Bayard Rustin and his influence on the Civil Rights Movement. He was born in 1912, was raised as a Quaker, was taught the value of nonviolent resistance and peace. Through A. Philip Randolph, Rustin met Dr. King in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956. He was uh, there to support the uh, bo bus boycott. After meeting him, Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement would never be the same. Dr. King had thought about nonviolent resistance, but was not committed to it until he met Bayard Rustin. And Rustin convinced him that nonviolent resistance was the best way to lead the civil rights movement. As a matter of fact, when he visited, Dr. King's house was well armed and full of guns. 
and he was prepared to lead the civil rights movement into what could have developed into a civil war in our country. But because of the influence of Bayard Rustin, Dr. King instead took the direction of nonviolent resistance. I have no idea what our country would be like today if the civil rights movement had taken a violent turn. I can tell you it wouldn't be like it is now. It'd probably be far more of a mess and we wouldn't have the history of Dr. King that we do. The March on Washington was one of the most successful of the civil rights movement. At that point in the movement, there was a great deal of concern that it was going to fracture and dissolve and disappear and not be successful. Someone put it this way, it came at the end of a summer of terror. The assassination of Medgar Evers, the Birmingham fire hoses and dogs. Then came the March on Washington, which re-energized people, inspired them, lifted up their hope again, and renewed their spirit. Following the success of the march, Rustin and Dr. King would continue to work together for years. Bayard Rustin passed away on August the 24th, 1987. But countless people were influenced by his life, particularly his organization of the 1963 March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King Jr. As a matter of fact, he was so influential that in 2013, he was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom because of his uh, unflagging commitment to nonviolent resistance in the civil rights movement. Everybody has heard of Martin Luther King Jr. Most people have never heard of Bayard Rushton, but without him, the civil rights movement as we know it would not have happened in the United States. I'm going to go back to war for a minute. Two of the most interesting characters in, in, really, I think, in all of history. One of the people that I've, I have a great deal of admiration for is Heinz Guderian. Now, Heinz Guderian was a general in World War I. And as a result of two things, he wrote a book called Octum Panzer. Now, the two converging things that happened that caused him to write this book were, number one, his study of Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, let me catch you up on what happened. Robert E. Lee had far fewer forces than the Union Army posed. But the Union Army followed standard procedure that day, which was a long line. But instead, Lee would take his forces, put them on cavalry so that they were able to move quickly. And wherever there was a, a, a place where he needed to be, he could move his troops there quickly, and he had them bunched together to fight at this point, and then to move and fight at this point, and then to move to fight at that point. And so, Guderian studied very closely what Robert E. Lee had done with mobile troops and massing them together to counteract the enemy or to mount an offensive. The second thing that Guderian had noticed was what tanks did in World War I. And so what he did was he took the ideas from Lee and married them not with cavalry but with tanks and said light, armored tanks bunched together moving swiftly is the way the future of warfare is going to be. Now you're thinking, where in the world is all this headed? Well, I'll give you one word. Heinz Guderian is the man who invented the Blitzkrieg. If you remember your history class, you remember the Blitzkrieg is bunching the forces and punching through, like through the Maginot Line, through the Ardennes Forest. And, and so Guderian's the one who invented all this. And here's something very fascinating. There was one, one general in the United States who had studied Heinz Guderian and who had agreed with him and said the future of warfare is going to be motorized divisions that can move swiftly in concentrated groups. No one believed him. No one believed that that would work until he did maneuvers in Louisiana. And he took his theories that he had gotten from Guderian, who had gotten them from Lee, applied the tank warfare, and was ridiculously successful on these maneuvers in Louisiana, though he'd been handicapped in the, by a, a, a number of his superiors. No one still believed that this would work in real life. It took years for that general to finally get his own command. And when he did, he led the greatest movement of troops in the history of all warfare. You've probably heard of him, George Smith Patton. I always like to say his middle name because I like it. Uh, it was his mom's maiden name, George S. Patton. And so, yeah, and, uh, now, there are, the, one of the reasons why Guderian is so fascinating is he actually wrote his own biography after the war, Panzer General. Guderian is the only person who rose to be a part of Hitler's inner circle who was ever fired rather than executed. And he was fired twice. Because he's the only one that had the guts to stand up to Hitler. After the war, he was not prosecuted for war crimes because of his character and his integrity and the fact that he wrestled with whether or not 
He wanted to fight for his country, even though it was an ideology that he did not agree with. He's a very committed Christian and follower of Jesus, and someday we'll get to meet him in heaven. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating man. Warfare as we now know it was changed forever by a man that most people have never even heard of. In fact, this was the reigning doctrine of warrior all the way until 1973 in the Sinai Desert. And you're probably not interested in Sagar missiles and all this. So well, it's, it's not a lesson on that military history. But anyway, so Heinz Guderian, another man, Moses, and, and his influence in changing the world, even though most people have never heard of him. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about him for me is because he has been very influential in our world without us realizing it. But also because we need to understand that great People do not always do great things for great good. Sometimes they do great things for great evil. None of us like Hitler. That'll make me really nervous here. So, as you know, another man who, who has incredible influence in the world and yet is not heard of. And I want to share with you my personal hero. All the people who have ever lived in the world before me, and from history, there's the one person that stands above them all. That is Anne Hasseltine Judson. Now, many people have heard of her husband, Adonai Judson. Adonai Judson's had universities named after him. There's a printing press named after him. As a matter of fact, the biography of life to the Golden Shore is one of the ten bestsellers of all time. Maybe you've probably heard of Adonai Judson. You've probably heard the name Judson somewhere because uh, it's been so influential in Christian circles. Adonai Judson was the first missionary from the United States to go overseas. And he had decided that because he felt called to serve overseas, that it would be best that he not be married and subject a wife to the hardships and rigors of being overseas in in a foreign land. However, he met and fell in love with a young girl named Anne Hasseltine. So he decided to ask her father for her hand in marriage. And he did so by writing a letter. And I want to read to you the letter that he wrote to Mr. Hasseltine requesting Anne's hand in marriage. Now, before I read it, you need to understand this was written in the 1700s. In those days, the word heathen didn't mean your children. Or heathen meant people that have never heard about Jesus. <clears throat> so this is what he wrote to his prospective father-in-law. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her never again in this world, whether you consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of lack and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory, with a crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamation of praise, which shall redound to her Savior, from heathen saved, to her means, from eternal woe and despair? Now, my sons-in-law didn't ask like that. He thought about it for a couple of days, and he said yes. Anne Hasseltine wrote a letter to a friend of hers, Lydia, and this is what she said. I feel willing and expect, if nothing in providence prevents, to spend my days in this world in heathen lands. Yes, Lydia, I have about come to the determination to give up all my comforts and enjoyments here, sacrifice my affection to relatives and friends, and go where God, in His providence, shall be fit to place me. She said yes. She went with Adonai Judson to India, and then eventually on to Burma. <clears throat> now, a couple of interesting things about what happened. They were on a ship, and another man who was going to work with them, named Luther Weiss, was on a different ship, and they were both headed uh, to the same location. On separate ships, they both realized that they would be meeting with William Carey, who was in India and was a Baptist missionary. They were both Congregationalists. Congregationalists believe in sprinkling babies. 
So both Adam Justin and Luther Rice realized they needed to study the New Testament so that they could give a ready defense when they encountered William Carey. However, as a result of reading the New Testament, both of them independent of each other and Anne Justin along with her husband came to the conclusion, the correct conclusion, that the Bible teaches that baptism is supposed to be of believers and supposed to be by immersion. You know, I'm saying a Baptist church, I expect more amens than that. They came to the conclusion that the Bible teaches baptism is of believers by immersion. So when they arrived, they were both baptized, and Luther Rice got back on a ship and headed back to the United States. Because now as Baptists, they would no longer be funded by the Congregationalists. Luther Rice logged over 10,000 miles on horseback, going all up and down the East Coast, speaking to church after church after church to raise money to fund Adoniram and Ann Judson on the mission field. While they were in Burma, Adoniram Judson was the most brilliant people that ever lived. He just had to get the languages, spoke multiple languages fluently. He very quickly mastered the Burmese language. He wanted to translate the Bible into Burmese so that they could read in their own language about the glory and the majesty and the wonder and the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. However, he was arrested and spent years in prison. Prisons in Burma in those days, there was no food provided for missionary, or for uh, prisoners. So Ann Judson every day brought food to her husband. With the food, she smuggled in paper and smuggled out paper. And while he was locked away in prison, God put him in prison so that he could focus on translating the Bible into Burmese. There are tens of thousands of Burmese Christians today as a direct result of reading the translation of the Bible that Adonai Judson made, that Ann Judson ferried in and out of the prison to him. He never could have done it without her. Without Ann Justin, there never would have been a translation to Burmese, and there would not be uh, the, the number of believers in Burma today or throughout history as a result of what she did. As a matter of fact, Ann Justin died in Burma and was buried in an unmarked grave. They found her diary, and they published it. So the memoirs of Ann Justin. Now, Folks in the office know that if our church catches on fire, two things got to come out of my office. My clock, because it's autographed, and this book. I replace everything else. Those two things got to come out. Uh, and then you the rest of it, whatever. You get your stuff. But these are only two things out of my office. Of all the books that have been written outside the Bible, this one has been the most influential in my life. When we get to heaven, first of all, I want to see Jesus. Secondly, I want to meet Ann Justin. See, I mean, people say, Who's people who know me, well, if you ask them, who is Paul's ultimate hero? That's an Ann Justin. You know, a 16-year-old girl left her family knowing she would never see them ever again. Risked her life every day to smuggle paper in and translation out so the people in Burma could hear about how great Jesus Christ is. She died on a foreign land and was buried in an unmarked grave. The world has heard about a lot of people. Most people have never heard about Ann Justin, unless they're at First Baptist Family the first time in October 2019. I'm telling you, Ann Justin is the kind of person that the kingdom has been built on. Of all the people, the fact that, that I'm ready to go, forsake my family, and to give my life on a foreign land to tell them about Jesus Christ. There is, to me, in my opinion, there's no greater hero in all the world than Ann Justin. Now, you may be wondering, why in the world are you talking about these people? Well, turn to 1 Kings chapter 4. Because what we're going to find is a list of people that the world does not know about. People that are not popular, not famous, not known. 1 Kings chapter 4. The Bible says, King Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were his high officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok, was the priest. Elahoreth and Ahijah, the sons of Shishah, were secretaries. Jehoshaphat, not the guy who to be king, a different one. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahavud, was recorder. 
Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the army. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. Zebu, the son of Nathan, was priest and king's friend. I like that. It's okay to be friends with someone that's your boss. And so he says, he's, you know, they, I, like, oh, I like that. Verse 6. Ahasuerus was in charge of the palace, and Adoniram, the son of Abdal, was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel, who provided food for the king and his household. Each man had to make provision for one month in the year. These were their names. Charlton Heston. Yeah, if you're reading your Bible, this is not the same Ben-Hur as the movie. Uh, Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. Ben Decker in Machaz, Shalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elabeth Hanan, Ben Hesed, and Erebo, to him belongs Sukkot and all the land of Ephraim. Ben Abinadab, in all Naphath's door, he had Taphath, the daughter of Solomon, as his wife, to work with Solomon Law. Bainab, the son of Ahalud, in Tanakh, Megiddo, and all Beth Shan, that is beside Zarephan, below Jezreel. And from Beth Shan to Abel Meholah, as far as the other side of Jotmim, Ben Geber and Ramoth Gilead, he had the villages of Yair, the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead. And he had the region of Argo, which is in Basan, 60 great cities with walls and bronze bars. Ahinadab, the son of Iddo, and Mahanaim, and Maaz, and Naphtali, he had taken base from Ahasuerus, the daughter of Solomon, as his wife. Baana, the son of Hushai, and Asher, and Bilo. Jehoshaphat, the son of Perith, another guy named Jehoshaphat, many like that name. Jehoshaphat, the son of Peru, and Issachar. Shemai, the son of Elah and Benjamin. Geber, the son of Uri, in the land of Gilead. The country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. And there was one governor who was over the land. Now, have you ever tried to read through the Bible? These are the chapters that are difficult. First of all, you can't pronounce half their names. Now, you don't know whether I pronounce them right or not. It's a I was somewhere close, and if you think you got it and I missed it, don't email me. Just be happy with yourself. <clears throat> and then you're going to go, we don't know who these people are. Other than Abby Aether and Jabba, a couple of them, none of them are ever mentioned again anywhere in the Bible. They're just, it's just a list of names. So, what's the takeaway? What's the significance of that? Here's what's significant. Actually, a couple of things. One, Solomon can't do it by himself. To run the country is going to require teamwork. God's kingdom is built on teamwork. You're not a lone ranger Christian out doing your thing. We work together as a team. We work, and, and, and God, the, the Bible uses illustrations about being one body or one family, all, but we work together as a team. We can't handle it ourselves. We support one another. We encourage one another. We work together. And now, connected with that, oftentimes most of the team goes unrecognized. We've got a list of names, but we don't know really anything about them except the help. Solomon. That's it. So, most of God's kingdom is built on people like Ann Judson. That people haven't heard of. Katerina Von Bora. That, that people, people that, they don't, that, that we don't know. And there are a few folks have their names up alike and they're famous. But most of, of history is filled with people who have served God in anonymity. They're not, they're not known. Listen. If your goal is to be famous for serving the Lord, you have missing the blessings of God. Most of us are going to serve God. No one's going to know. But that leaves the most important thing. We don't serve Him to get credit. We serve Him because He is worthy. Why in the world does a 16-year-old girl leave her family to go die overseas to never see them again? You know, there's no FaceTime or anything back then. Why in the world is it? Because Jesus... Is worthy. That's why he is worthy. The, the reason we serve in anonymity is because he is worthy. My parents' church recently celebrated, he's a family friend, a man who for 30 years did all the landscaping at the church for free. Most people, people will have no idea who he is. Most people at church didn't even know that he did it. Week in and week out for three decades. Do you know how much money that church was able to spend on missions because they didn't spend it on landscaping? Serve in anonymity. I'm telling you, if you would ask him, was it worth it? He would say, yes, Jesus is worth it. 
God's kingdom is built on people who serve not to make a name for themselves, but to exalt and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. And when we get to heaven, there will be millions of people that no one has ever heard of. But God knows who you are. God knows who all these people are. He knows how many hairs were on their head. He knew every detail about them. You may be anonymous to the world, but you are never anonymous to God. The world may say what you're doing is of no value, but God will never say that. The world may say you're wasting your life, but God will never say that. It is never a life wasted spent serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we are a team that works not to make a name for ourselves, but to make a name for Jesus Christ because He is worthy. The reason we call you to serve is because Jesus is worthy. Listen, six of us cannot pull off walk through Bethlehem. It's going to take the whole church team. All of us. And why in the world will we give up three nights in December when it's cool, not cold? Ain't no snow coming down here. But when it's cool outside, you give us several hours, three nights in a row. Why in the world will we do that? Do you know why we do that? I'll tell you why we do it. Because Jesus is worthy of us doing that. And our names are never going to show up in life. We're never going to be celebrated. But God knows and God uses us for His honor and for His glory. So that leads to the one question. Why is Jesus worthy of us sacrificing ourselves for Him? Quite simple. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be forgiven. And He whooped up all over death on Sunday morning when He walked out of the tomb to guarantee me everlasting life in heaven. Because of that, Jesus is worthy. Don't do it for your own credit. Do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. You will never regret it.